Hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Corinne. This is my first book buzz, and I want to thank you all for coming out on such a chilly night. I'm going to give, I think uh, many of you are like seasoned book buzz people, but because I'm, it's my first one, I'm still going to kind of lay the groundwork a little bit. So um, the five of us all work here at the library in various departments, and we have various genres and all of those different things that we like to read. And so tonight we're going to be sharing some of our reading recommendations, and we'll tell you a little bit about the books and why we think you might like them as well. And hopefully you'll leave with some fun and cozy recommendations to take home with you. So as you'll see over here, we have some extra copies of some of the books. Um, a few of them are very new, so you might have to get on the wait list for them. We're happy to give you a hand with that. And then if you do see one here, feel free to grab it and take it home with you at the end of the night. Just check it out and have fun. Um, and then we also have these bookmarks at the back of the room if you want to see all of the titles that we're talking about. And then we also have our 2022 gift book guide. If you are shopping for someone and you have no idea what to buy them, we always recommend a book. We think that's a great place to start. And so we have suggestions for adults, and then we also have our guide for kids and teens. So feel free to grab one of those as well. And with that, we're just going to jump in, and I'm going to go and pass it down to Patty, who's going to start us off. Hello, everyone. Um, the first book that I'm going to be buzzing about is The Revolutionary Samuel Adams by Stacey Schiff, which I wouldn't call cozy, um, but stick with me and I'll tell you why I picked it. Um, so Samuel Adams is not nearly as written about as many of the other founding fathers, and he is, was widely considered by his contemporaries to be the father of the American Revolution. He was born into a wealthy family in Boston, and the family went into financial ruin because of an act of parliament. So this sort of incited him and stirred him up to, you know, foment the revolution. So he held several jobs throughout his life, um, and he was a tax collector at one point. He was a maltster because they had a malt house on the property. Um, and he began writing and writing under pseudonyms to try to just get the public incited for the revolution. So finally, uh, he was the mastermind behind the Boston Tea Party in December of 1773. Um, and so he, kind of used this journalistic skill that he had to write pseudonymously for many years, even when things were kind of quieting down with the revolutionary movement after the Boston Massacre, he wanted to stir it up again so that they could get the job done. And Stacy Schiff's challenge says, the historian's challenge is finding information about him because he was a revolutionary, he didn't leave a paper trail. He burned his papers, he burned his letters. There's one scene in the book where his cousin, John Adams, is actually watching him throw his papers into the fire. So she said that one of uh, the places that she was able to find some information was actually the British archives, because she said he was widely considered the nemesis of the royal governors of Massachusetts. So, and this is what Ron Chernow, the author of Alexander Hamilton, has to say about this book. With incomparable wit, grace, and insight, Stacy Schiff narrates the birth of the American Revolution in Boston and the artful, elusive magician who made it all happen, Samuel Adams. For too long, Adams, hiding behind many masks and stratagems, has evaded historians, but Schiff draws him from the shadow into the spotlight he so richly deserves. So I highly recommend this book for anybody who, who loves history, the history of Boston, American history. It's a great book, great read. So my first book is called My Dear Hamilton, um, another historical novel, but this one's historical fiction. Um, it's by Stephanie Dre and Laura Kamoy. Um, so it's about Eliza Hamilton, who um, was much more than just her husband, she kind of, um, I feel like she gets obviously overshadowed by him because, you know, he did so much. Um, but so I read this book before I had watched Hamilton or knew anything about him, really. I'm not really a huge history person. Um, and 
they just do the authors do such a great job of just painting like this really vivid picture that I was just like completely sucked in for hours at a time and as I said I read it before I knew anything about the Hamiltons and they did go through their fair share of tragedies um, and I remember sitting on the porch reading it just bawling my eyes out um, <laughs> And uh, so it really, I mean, it's just, it's like a, it's a quaint book. Um, if you like Hamilton, then this is definitely for you. Um, if Helpless or Satisfied is your favorite song, this one's definitely for you. Um, so it starts when Eliza's young, just before she meets Alexander. So it starts before Alexander and it ends after Alexander. It goes until, um, I think the 1840s. Um, so as she did, she went on to do many things after Hamilton passed away. So it talks a lot about what she went on to do. Um, most of the book is set in fact, but it is historical fiction. So they have taken liberties with some of the events. And there's an author note in the back <coughs> that kind of explains what they've taken liberty with and why. Um, but they did pull as much as possible out of her documents, but kind of similar to John Adams, um, there's not a lot to go on. So they do a great job of explaining their methodology and why they chose different things. Um, but if you like historical fiction, colonial America, this is a great one for you. All right, so for my first one, um, I wanted to go with a cookbook. And so this is Pyometry. It's by Lauren Coe. Um, I first discovered Lauren's um, pie creations on Instagram, actually, and she posts, they're so intricate and geometric and beautiful, and I was delighted when I learned that there was this accompanying cookbook, and she not only is a master of pies, but a master of puns, and so it's a really fun read, even though it's a cookbook, and to be completely honest, I have kind of my two tried and true uh, pie recipes that I go back to, so I haven't actually tried any of the recipes in here, but it's she makes baking really um, approachable and fun and colorful and inventive, and even if you're not a baker, I would suggest just flipping through it because you'll see how many different really um, like piece by piece how she puts together her designs. I don't know if you can see the back of the book here, but she'll cut up all of the different pieces and then lay them out just so artistically, and it's just gorgeous. Um, and there's always this fun bit of like, d does it hold up when it bakes? And how does, <laughs> does it survive the baking process? And it gets there. And um, she also just runs through like very, just from like a very beginner level of how to make the dough and how to make the, the filling and putting it all together, and they're just beautiful. Um, and throughout, there's just every possible tart or pie-related pun on words that you could even conceive of. And I will also use this as a chance to plug that we recently pulled out our cookbooks upstairs. So if you haven't been up to the second floor recently, definitely check it out because you'll find all of our cookbooks in one place across from the information desk and next to our living library. And if you ever need any cooking or baking inspiration, definitely go upstairs and check it out. <coughs> First book, I don't really do cozy reads, so <laughs> my first book is Daisy Darker by Alice Feeney, and I mean, all my books, uh, people die in tonight, but this is the only one where they're actually like murdered and there's a lot of them, but it's cozy, it's in England, and the grandmother, she writes children's books, and the family's name is Darker, and the, all the girls are named after flowers, and you go to the grandmother's house for her 80th birthday. You can only go when the tide is out because it washes away the road, so they're stuck there. At <laughs> and right around midnight, there's a noise. They wake up. One member of the family is dead, and there's a like a poem in chalk on on the wall. So it's very kind of like, kind of an old fashioned sort of Agatha Christie kind of mystery, which I really, that's my version of Cozy is cuddling up with a good thriller. So, <laughs> but I really, I was really surprised with the twist at the end and that doesn't usually happen. So I would really, I haven't read her other stuff, but I hear good things. I would really recommend it for your, your cozy winter read. <laughs> that sounds so good. <laughs> I don't know, I'm, 
Okay, so hi there, uh, my name is Susie. I have a history of doing book buzzes um, recently that I have just gotten addicted to romance. I don't know what happened to me, I used to do the mystery thing, but I'm a romance buff, a buff now. So, one thing that I've been asked to do though is to rate the heat of my books from now on, on a scale. We're gonna start off with this one, nice and slow. This is a very, very, very sweet novel. It's called In a Holidays by Christina Lauren. So this book is about a woman named uh, Malin Jones. And right now, it's during the holiday season, and she's just not doing so great in life. She's living with her parents, she's just lost her job, and she is incredibly unlucky in love. But every year they travel back to a little cabin in Utah, which has been their family place to go with two other couples, two other families. And they've always had a wonderful time, so not, no matter what was going on in Malin's life, the year always started off perfectly because she gets to go to this little cabin. Well, this year she goes there and there's nothing but disaster after disaster. One brother who she secretly had a crush on for her entire life, she ends up having a little bit too much eggnog one night and kisses his brother, which turns out to be just a hairy situation. From there on, things get worse and worse and worse until the next day, Maylin thankfully gets into her car and drives away. As she's driving away, she says up to the sky, please show me what will make me happy. All of a sudden, there's a crack, boom, bing, and she wakes up and she is in a plane flying back to the Utah cabin. This goes on and on as a loop until Maylin finds her true happiness. I truly recommend this. This isn't like um, your basic romance. It's very sweet. It will make you feel warm and tingly inside. It's the perfect seasonal romance. I would say One Flame, and I loved it, which is saying something. <laughs> So the next book that, I'm, uh, that I want to talk about is directed by James Burroughs. And I loved this book. So he is the legendary director of like some of the best loved sitcoms on TV, including Taxi, Cheers, Frasier, Will and & Grace, and Friends, and many more. Um, this is his memoir, looking back on his life as a director, he, he began, he was from a show business family. His father was sort of a legendary Broadway playwright and director, Abe Burroughs. And so James himself got his start on Broadway, acting and writing um, and directing. And then in 1974, he had the opportunity to go and work on the Mary Tyler Moore show. And so that started his career as a television sitcom director. So it, I, I just loved every page of this book because I love most of those shows, actually all of them. Um, but he talks about how they developed the plots and how they chose the characters and when they were trying to pick um, the, the, um, the Ted Danson and Shelley Long characters eventually, um, Sam and Diane, they did casting, but they did casting in pairs to see the chemistry between the, the actors. and. Um, and then another actually good anecdote, which I'm going to read out of here just real quick, is they knew they wanted to do Cheers as they wanted to do a sports bar. They were trying to figure out what city to put it in, but they wanted to, initially it was gonna be some random city in California. Then they said, well, it has to be a sports town where people really get behind the team. So they said, once we, once we settled on a sports bar, we ruled out New York City as a setting, not only because it had been overdone, but more important, because it had multiple teams for the same sport. We considered Boston, Philadelphia, and Detroit, where local fans really love their sports and everyone roots for the same team. We decided on Boston because it was an accent and because it was such a distinctive town, working class and cosmopolitan at the same time. We spent two months going to bars to study the atmosphere. Glenn, who was one of the writers, called me one night at 1 a.m. my time, which was 4 a.m. in Boston, and he said, I found our place. It was the Bull and Finch, a bar located below street level. We used it as a model. The downstairs aspect gave us a lot of creative opportunity. 
We use the image of feet on the staircase a lot during the run, which I distinctly remember. We're big Cheers uh, fans in my household. So it was he has all, all anecdotes about the different characters, the actors that he formed, really very strong bonds with. And uh, it just really gave a behind the scenes look at how those shows came together. So for anybody on your list of you know gifts who is a fan of any of those sitcoms, I really love this book. I thought it was great. So my next book is a YA book called American Royals. Um, I just think that there's something really special about any book about the White House or royalty. Um, and this puts them both together, which is great. Um, so it's about um, present day if Washington had become a king instead of a president. Um, so this is present day following his descendants. And so it's from the point of view of four young women. Um, one of them is B. She's the firstborn of the current queen and king. Um, and she's the first in line for the throne after her father. And she's also the first woman to be in line for the throne because the rule has just changed. So she's feeling a lot of pressure that, you know, everything is on her. Um, and on top of all of that, she now has to pick a husband from a short list of candidates. Um, so just kind of like everything's happening to her all at once. And then um, another point of view is Sam, which is her younger sister, who um, is one of the twins. And so it goes B, Jefferson, which is their brother, and then Sam. So Sam is like the very youngest. Um, so she deals with a lot of um, anxiety and thoughts about how the press see her. Um, there's a lot of comparison about how the same behavior with her brother versus her is portrayed in the media, which is really interesting. Um, and she is also, um, kind of infatuated with one of B's suitors, which you know wasn't going to go well. Um, there's Nina, who's Sam's best friend, who the Prince Jefferson is um, currently interested in, and Daphne, who's the ex-girlfriend of Jefferson, who will, she's like ruthless and will do anything to get back with Jefferson to be, all she wants is to be in the monarchy, so she'll kind of do that at all costs. Um, so this is kind of an enchanting mix of both like, royalty and White House. Um, and it's like equal parts drama, equal parts romance. Um, and it's just a really enjoyable read. So that's, that's my recommendation. All right. Uh, so for my next one, I have Rosalind Palmer Takes the Cake by Alexis Hall. This one is for anyone who likes romance and likes to watch the Great British Baking Show. So our title character, Rosalind Palmer, lands a place competing on a TV baking show called Bake Expectations, um, which I'm going to always love a good pun, so I'm here for it. And she finds herself dating one of her fellow contestants while at the same time slowly coming to realize exactly how much she wants to win the competition. And um, this one is a romance. I would say it's on the steamier side, but I... I don't know exactly how the rankings were, but I, I, would, I would say it's, it's a little, it's definitely a little bit more, more, yes, yeah. Um, and, but before you think that it's all baking and flirting, there is an incredible amount of emotional growth. So at the start, Rosalind is a single mom and she knows how to stand for others, particularly her daughter, but she really, really struggles with speaking up for herself and her dreams and what she wants to do like for herself as an individual person. And throughout the book, we see her figure out what she wants. She um, realizes like how to pursue her goals, even when they don't match with what's expected of her, both by her parents and society at large. And she also learns to recognize some major red flags in other people's behavior. So I do want to note that there is um, a scene with like some sexual assault and gaslighting. And fortunately, Rosalind is able to safely remove herself from the situation. But for, and for the rest of the book, we see her really come into her own in a very satisfying way. And um, one thing I'm very excited about, so that's, that's this book. And then there's another book that just came out in the same world that we return to Bake Expectations um, called Paris Delancourt is About to Crumble. And I'm definitely going to go pick that up next. My next book is We All Want Impossible Things by Catherine Newman. And 
again, not a traditional cozy read, but this is about um, Edie and Ash have been friends their entire life, and they are in their early 40s, and Edie has ovarian cancer, and she's dying. And they're in the hospital in New York, and they make the recommendation she needs to move to hospice. She, she has a husband and a young son. There's a long waiting list for the hospice in New York City. So she goes home with her best friend to a hospice in Massachusetts. And it's, there really is no real plot. They're just basically waiting day to day. She's, they go back over their lives and Ash's life is quietly falling apart while she tries to like be this person for her best friend. And it's just, it's so sweet and funny. It's not as sad as it should be because uh, it's just a story about, you know, being that person for somebody who really needs it. And it, it is cozy in that way if you have, you know, friends who are family or a best friend. And I really, really loved it. <laughs> not depressing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, my next book is called The Winter Garden. And this is written by Emma Hardy. Um, some people believe that gardening is really a, an activity to do only in the spring and the summer, maybe a little bit of decor in the fall. But it's actually a really great time to experiment. Um, there are a lot of really beautiful, hardy plants that you can find around the area and um, all over the place in nurseries and greenhouses. So this book I particularly like because it was very, very clever. You, many pictures are inside. I did um, tag the pages. If you're curious in what I did, I can't hold it up at the same time as the microphone, but um, some of them, oh, thank you. So there's some great ideas in here. They use a lot of succulents um, and a lot of things that you can find around the house. They have beautiful pictures of amaryllis, and this is for everybody, too. You don't necessarily have to have a green thumb. There's some very, it, it ranges from very simple product projects to a little bit more difficulty. Um, but it's a really nice book to flip through the pages to try. Um, anybody can do it. There's beautiful little terrariums that you can make at home. And it really pepped me up when the days are dark and it's cold out um, to just to be able to, to work with soil and greens. So this is my favorite winter book that we have upstairs in the living library right now. Um, again, there's things like paper whites and all sorts of just, just fun and creative and inspirational um, projects to do. So the next book that I'm going to buzz about is called Dinners with Ruth, A Memoir on the Power of Friendships. And it's by Nina Totenberg. And um, this, this has been a very popular book. Um, it's been on the bestseller list. Um, Nina Totenberg is, as you probably all know, is legal affairs correspondent for National Public Radio. And this is her memoir of her life as a journalist, her life, her family, childhood, but infused in the book is, are many stories about her relationship with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which began in 1971 when Nina Totenberg was doing a story and she was having a hard time understanding a legal brief. So she decided to call somebody who worked at a, a law professor and that was Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was the law professor at Rutgers University. So they began a relationship, at first a professional relationship, which continued um, all the way through their lives, but also they de developed a deep friendship as well. And um, during the lockdown, Ruth Bader Ginsburg had at this point in time been off and on sick for about 20 years. Um, she was you know, very ill, and so Nina and her husband entertained her every Saturday at their home. She was by then a widow. They entertained her, they kind of kept her in their bubble, and 23 consecutive Saturday nights they had RBG over for dinner. And she tells like very heartwarming stories about their relationship. She also tells her own story, Nina's story about how she was a woman in a male-dominated profession. She was sometimes the only female in the newsroom. 
and she's the reporter who broke the Anita Hill story and got Anita Hill to go, you know, before Congress and, and speak at the hearings. Um, so there's a lot about her career, about her family, and just, they had a lot in common. These two women had a lot in common, but they forged a beautiful friendship. So this um, book is, would be a wonderful book for anybody who's interested in US history, the Supreme Court, um, and the power of the friendships that you forge along the way. So my last book is called The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Klune. Um, this is a fantasy novel, <coughs> and it's about Linus Baker, who works for the, um, the Department in Charge of Magical Youth, or Dicomy. And um, he's a caseworker, so he goes and investigates orphanages where um, magical youth are kept. And so he will make recommendations on whether they should remain in service or if they should be shut down. Um, and he's like very buttoned up. He, you know, he goes to work and he leaves at the exact same time. And you know, he's a number on a desk and um, he reads rules and regulations for fun. And um, he has like passive aggressive fights with his neighbor and that's pretty much it. Um, and so one day he gets a, uh, like a brief, a briefing to go see extremely upper management. And so he's terrified about what's gonna happen. And um, they basically send him on like this top secret mission where he's going to go to an island orphanage um, that is full of youth that are like highly classified. Um, and so he goes to investigate. They're really interested particularly in the caretaker of the orphanage whose name is Arthur. Um, and so he goes there and he takes a train, he gets to the island and his first interaction is he's going through a garden and he sees a garden gnome and he's like, oh, look at this cute little statue. And the statue starts talking to him because it's uh, one of the children. And so she is there because she's the world's first and only female garden gnome. Her name is Talia. And she promptly threatens to bury him with her shovel. And that pretty much sets the tone for the rest of the book. It's very funny. It's lighthearted. It's hilarious. Um, some of the other magical youth that he meets are Chauncey, who nobody really knows what he is. He's like, he's like some sort of sea creature almost. Like he has tentacles. He's got like stalks for his eyes. And um, but his dream in life is to be a bellhop, and it's adorable. Um, there's Theodore, which is a wyvern, which is kind of like a small dragon. There is Fee, who's a forest sprite. Sal, who's a teenage boy who can shapeshift into a five pound uh, Pomeranian. And there's Lucy, which is short for Lucifer, who is the six, six year, six month, and six day old reincarnation of the Antichrist. Um, and so it is just, it's like a really charming read <laughs> right after the Antichrist. Um, he typically prides himself on being a rule follower and being very, you know, um, detail oriented, but he finds himself being charmed and warming up to these children as well as their caretaker. And he realizes that um, he deserve that these kids deserve more in life than the hand that they've been dealt. Um, and so it's a heartwarming tale of found family, personal growth. Um, it'll make you laugh the whole way through. And if you like audio, it is fantastic on audio and it's available on Hoopla so you can get it right away. Um, I listen to it to refresh my memory. Well, I listened to it the first time, but I re-listened to some of it to refresh my memory on some of the characters and I just listened to the whole thing again and I was thrilled too. <laughs> All right. So for my last one, I'm going to be talking about Winter's Orbit by Everina Maxwell. Um, this one is a really fun mix of a lot of different like genres and settings and characters. So there is romance, there's political intrigue, there's conspiracy, there's kind of a murder mystery aspect to it, and it's all set in space. Um, so we have Prince Kiam, who is a m really minor figure within the emperor's royal family, and Count Janin, who comes from this like delegation planet, and they have to the two of them have to marry purely for diplomatic purposes to strengthen the bonds between their planets because Count Janin was married and his husband died mysteriously. There's all this like weird stuff that goes on that's all very much about like, well, diplomatically, this is what you have to do, so just don't complain. 
And the part that I really loved the most was that um, we so clearly see Kim and Janin's different personalities and how their personalities and personal histories have shaped their interactions both with each other and with others that they interact with. And for anybody else who also regularly reads romance, it's really common for the big like, mm -hmm. plot point that happens is just this major miscommunication. And that always really bothers me because it would just be all so solved so quickly if the characters could just talk with each other. <laughs> just, just sit down and have a conversation. But here, it works so much better because the characters have such clearly defined different like cultural backgrounds and personal fears and like baggage that they bring into this relationship that they're forced into when they are basically strangers. And so despite their best efforts to try to communicate, they really have to learn how and like start from nothing because they don't understand that they're misunderstanding each other because of what they're bringing, they're both bringing to the relationship. And that's just really beautifully crafted. In addition, there's all of these secrets and conspiracies that are going on that help keep the plot moving of figuring out like, how did Count Janin's husband die? Like, what's going on? Who's trying to do what with all this political intrigue? And I'm not like a political thriller person. That part doesn't interest me usually, but it, it worked so well and I was so surprised by like what was actually happening plus with this really great romance coming up, coming together. Um, and this, similar to my previous book, there's another, there's a new book in, set in the same universe that I'm really excited to check out called Ocean's Echo. So there you go. Uh, my last book is Other Birds by Sarah Addison Allen. Um, she is kind of like Alice Hoffman light. There's sort of a magical aspect, but not really to all her books. But this one's about Zoe, whose mother dies when she's 12 and leaves her a condo she has on this island in South Carolina called Mallow Island that has been made famous from this old book that everybody has read from the 60s. So she moves back alone because she has an evil stepmother and her dad doesn't care. And so she moves all the way across the country by herself. And it's one of those like, perfect magical kind of stars hollow places where everybody has these like big characters and everything is a little quirky yet perfect and she makes friends with like all the other people in the condo complex and they there's this accident where this woman who is a hoarder uh, dies so her job is now to go through everything and figure out the story of her life because she had told people she left behind this great book and the story of her life that explains the way she was. And that's basically, it's, so it goes back and forth between Zoe's life and the life that she's uncovering for this woman. But it's all, it's very sweet and little too, there's friends everywhere she meets and people who need jobs get jobs right away. and. It, but it's just very, very sweet. Like a, it's like it's like a warm bath kind of read. Is <laughs> I enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> Sounds so sweet. <laughs> okay, woo wee. <laughs> We've got window shopping written by Tessa Bailey. So I'm just gonna tell you right off the bat from a three flame kind of rating. This is around a five. So just want to let you know. Um, it is very seasonal though, so I kept within the limitations of what I could present, so I'm good. Um, this is a really kind of fun, fun book. This book is about a woman named Stella, and Stella has been kind of down on her luck. And she has a sort of edgy kind of personality, and she kind of brushes people off, and she's a little bit closed in. So one day she's walking down the street in Manhattan, and she notices this big department store window. And she kind of stands there and stares at it. And there's green streamers here, and there's red streamers there. And she's kind of befuddled by this very famous department store's window. So of course, around five minutes later, this tall, dark, and handsome man comes up to her and notices that she's looking at the window and asks her opinion. Well, do you like the, the window? And she th stops and thinks about it for a second. And she says, no, it's a tragedy and tinsel. I don't. So she comes to find out that this man named Aiden is actually the general manager of the store. 
and they've just lost their window dresser. And he asked her if she would please maybe consider applying for the position. So with a little back and forth, she decides to go for the shot. And she does submit her resume. And they decide that they will give her um, a, a, a shot at doing the window. So she ends up doing these beautiful, elaborate, gorgeous windows that end up drawing people into the street. And she's not only drawing in people off the street, she's starting to draw in the attention of um, the general manager, Aiden. So if you want to read more about that, which it's a super fun, really fun book, um, I highly recommend Window Shopping. So that's the end of our books that we're presenting today. Thank you all so much for coming. And uh, again, if you want to grab a copy of some of these books, come up here and take a look. And for any that we um, don't have available, let us know and we'll help you request some. All right. Thank you.